All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 8, Section 4, The United States Goes Back to War. So in sections uh, pretty much 8.1 through 8.3, one of the key events taking place in the early years of the Republic, that is the period after the Constitution was ratified, was the French Revolution. And really the French Revolution was the most important foreign affair going on. And that war saw France behead their king. Uh, and then more or less all the other monarchies of Europe, including England, or Britain we'll say, uh, go to war. And in this divide between France and Britain, you had your democratic republicans, uh, favor the French side, and you had your Federalists favor the British side. Uh, however, the party that was in power in the United States was the Democratic Republicans, starting with Thomas Jefferson, moving on to James Madison, and then James Monroe. This era of good feelings, or this Virginia dynasty, was 25 rules of Democratic Republicans. So generally speaking, the relationship was good with France. Because the Federalists kept losing the uh, elections in the United States, that meant that the United States' relationship with Great Britain will uh, you know, continuously deteriorate to the point where the United States goes back to war with the British once again. And that's more or less what is covered in this particular section. So one way that Thomas Jefferson dealt with the, deteriorating, uh, the relationship that was deteriorating with the British was to pass an embargo on the British. This was a strategy that had been used during the revolutionary period. The boycotting of British goods proved to be effective, hopefully by discontinuing trade, which is essentially what an embargo is. This would bring Great Britain to their knees and, and kind of realize their, um, their miscues towards the United States. The Napoleonic Wars, that is simply just another term for this conflict of France versus Great Britain. Of course, Napoleon, during the French Revolution, had named himself the Emperor of France. If you recall, it was uh, Napoleon who the United States purchased the Louisiana Territory from. The British continued their practice of impressment or the impressed or impressed American sailors. This is forcing U.S. citizens to serve uh, in the British, we'll say Navy, right? So to impress someone is to force them to serve. So the British essentially would kidnap American sailors, force them to serve in the uh, in the British Navy. And this was obviously objected by the Americans. And this was one of the main reasons why the United States and Great Britain once again goes to war. In one particular incident, the US ship, the Chesapeake, you had Americans killed. And when these Americans were killed, it was a, an effort to impress gone wrong, essentially. You had calls in the United States for war against Great Britain. The Embargo Act of 1807 was Thomas Jefferson's response. It failed miserably. Essentially, what Jefferson wanted was the United States to stop trading with the British. So he forbid any American ships from leaving. The impact that it actually had was that it devastated the American economy. It really had no effect on the British but it really killed American merchants. This is a political cartoon of the Embargo Act because essentially what American merchants did was they left, uh, but they never came back. Uh, so this was, was a failure. The Non-Intercourse Act of 1808 repealed the very unpopular uh, and failed Embargo Act, right? Right, repealed the Embargo Act. Meanwhile, in the West, two Native American leaders emerge, right? Native American leaders. And that is Tecumseh and, let's see if I can say this, Tescanwatawa, right? Tescanwatawa was a religious prophet. Oops, P-R-O. Prophet, 
And he spread or preached the message about resisting European influence, you know, specifically things like alcohol, which was very devastating to Native American communities. Tecumseh was much more of a, a warrior type. And he was able to create both Tecumseh and Tezcanwatawa, uh, a confederacy of tribes to resist U.S. Uh, immigration into the West. This is tied to the conflict in Britain because Great Britain supported Native American resistance to U.S. migrations and U.S. occupation of Western territories. William Her uh, Henry Harrison was the American governor of this particular region and waged war against Tecumseh and his allies. At the Battle of Tippecanoe, the U.S. won only further pushing uh, Indians uh, west, right? So further pushing Indians west. More and more conflict going on on the west. But of course, pay attention to the uh, relationship with Great Britain here because it's both uh, impressment, right? The Chesapeake affair and the fact that British supports um, you know, these Native American uprisings in the West uh, that really get the United States going down this war path. And so the War of 1812 is what this conflict with Great Britain is. So the War of 1812 is U.S. versus Britain, right? It is also the first declared war Uh, in you know in the US or at least under the constitutional uh, government and it was being pushed by a group of people called the Warhawks so the Warhawks are people who wanted war with Britain right wanted war with Britain Henry Clay from Kentucky John C Calhoun from South Carolina we'll talk more about these individuals but they begin emerging as kind of a new generation of leadership the Federalists opposed war with Britain. I oppose war with Britain uh, for a couple reasons. One is that in the French Revolution, they supported the British side, right? So in the French Revolution, they supported the British side. But maybe more importantly was that, and we'll go ahead and use our green here to indicate it, is that war with Great Britain would greatly hurt their business, right? Especially for those located in New England, it would cut off commerce. The British would essentially force, um, you know, an embargo on the United States and those businesses would be hurt very badly. Regardless, the president at the time, uh, James Madison, does declare war. And so the war hawks are successful in getting the president to push towards war. Recall that Washington, right, his position was neutrality. Uh, by the time you get to 1812, which is, you know, you've gone from Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, now James Madison, who is the fourth president, a Democratic Republican, the United States can no longer maintain this neutrality and has found itself now at war with Great Britain. This also means resumed warfare in the West. So Tecumseh, who led that Western Confederation of Indian resistance against the US government is killed during the War of 1812. We can think of the War of 1812 as not just US versus Britain, but we might also say Western, uh, maybe not even Western, uh, and Indians or Native Americans, right? Uh, at the beginning of the war, it doesn't really go all that great for the U.S. There is some defeats. There are some victories. Not a lot changes. The nature of the war uh, does change when Napoleon surrenders. Uh, and that means the British, because the British are fighting France over in Europe. Once Napoleon surrenders, the British can focus on the U.S. This includes the burning down of Washington, D.C. This was burned. This image here, you can see the, let's see if I can get a different color so maybe you can see it a little bit better, but this is uh, showing the aftermath of the War of 1812 and the White House was burned. You can see the burn marks uh, on this picture here. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously 
having to evacuate the capital and having the capital, Washington, D.C., be burned to the ground is not an indication that the United States was winning the war. However, after Washington, D.C., British forces were stopped at the Battle of Baltimore. What's probably more famous from the Battle of Baltimore was Francis Scott Key writing the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner. The Star Spangled Banner is the national anthem. If you actually listen to the words of the Star Spangled Banner, it's describing a battlefield in which, you know, the flag was still there. Americans or the American side, you know, was able to preserve itself. And so the British were stopped at this particular battle. And it more or less uh, devolved into a stalemate. The Treaty of Ghent ended the war. The war itself was more or less a tie. However, both sides claimed victory, right? Both sides claimed victory. So not really a lot changed, you know, borders stayed the same. Um, you know, the, the war itself didn't have a dramatic shift or outcome for either side. Both sides claimed that they won. However, there are two kind of very important consequences that come from this war. One is what happens to the Federalists. The Federalists meet in Hartford, uh, uh, Connecticut, and they list their grievances, including opposition to the War of 1812, among other things. Uh, they're also uh, sort of another grievance that they have is that the Democratic Republicans, so Democratic Republicans, uh, have controlled more or less the White House and the Congress for you know the past you know how many ever long twelve years it's been, and so. There's a list of grievances that the Federalist leadership, again, the Federalists is the party of Washington, the party of Adams, the party of Hamilton, they haven't been in power for a while, uh, that, they, that they sort of air out. And one of the possibilities that they suggest is to secede, and that is to break away from the Union or the country, right? To secede means to break away from the Union. So there's this there's this sort of uh, airing of grievances and at least the possibility of breaking away from the U.S. being discussed. Um, this is going to paint, and eventually this, this convention will paint the Federalists in a very negative light, as we'll see. They essentially uh, be accused, they're essentially going to be accused of treason, right, for wanting to break away and being opposed to the War of 1812. Meanwhile, after the Treaty of Ghent is, is signed, and this is the second important outcome. So the first important outcome is the Hartford Convention. The second important outcome is Andrew Jackson. And that is because after the Treaty of Ghent was signed, the British attacked New Orleans. Right, attacked New Orleans. And this is significant because Andrew Jackson's successful in defending. The British army is uh, defeated. And this victory at the Battle of New Orleans turns Andrew Jackson more or less overnight into a war hero. He becomes the most popular person in the United States for having defeated a very large British army at the Battle of New Orleans, paving the way for his political career.